Marcus. Well, good morning, everyone. I, uh, I have a few minutes to give you an overview of um, what I think is driving Arctic marine transport and, and what it means to the world. There's a lot in the press about this. It's a, interesting topic. There's a lot of misrepresentation and misinformation about how the global shipping enterprise works. And so uh, we did this Arctic uh, Council had an Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment from about 2004 to 2009. The Arctic Council is an intergovernmental forum of the eight Arctic states, has six indigenous groups called the permanent participants around the table with the Arctic states. And, and, and the focus of the council is environmental protection and sustainable development. It's not military uh, security, it's, it's not whaling, <laughs> and it's not fisheries. So very focused on how do we protect the place and people in the Arctic and having engagement of the uh, indigenous people. Uh, lots of ships in the Arctic Ocean at the beginning of the 21st century, uh, 6,000 uh, vessels, 12,000 transits roughly in 2005, more to, a few more today. See if I can get these going here. Yeah, I think uh, this image gives you an idea, and Alex will follow up here, of, of what the new maritime Arctic is today. This is an offshore uh, terminal in the Russian Arctic. It's called the Baron Day Terminal. It was uh, built and uh, invested by uh, Luke Oil and ConocoPhillips, uh, were the primary companies that developed this uh, offshore platform. But the ships, the ice-breaking ships that uh, services platform and carry oil, uh, the oil comes from the beach, it's piped to the terminal, and they carry oil in a shuttle system, three ice-breaking tankers. And those tankers were built all in, uh, uh, by Samsung, who built uh, the cell phones. They also build ships. And the technology that was used and purchased by the Koreans is Finnish. And the ship, of course, the three ships are flagged by Sokomplot, the largest shipping enterprise in Russia today. So there you have it, lots of players, American Oil Company, Russian National Oil Company, uh, Korean shipbuilders, Finnish technologists, lots of investment, lots of players. This is the new maritime Arctic uh, that we're uh, dealing with, I, I would argue. And you have ice, of course. It's Arctic, but only seasonal ice. This is in the south east corner of the Barents Sea. So we have seasonal ice, oh, maybe three, four months a year, five months, Alex, I think. So it's not, it's not year-round ice cover, but we have ice-breaking ships. Now, some of these ships have recently been used, there are three in a shuttle system here, to, to carry some oil to China in the summertime. So it's interesting development where the ships go eastbound across the northern sea route. Uh, just a couple comments about sea ice, because it gets it's profound changes, as we know, in the Arctic Ocean, anthropogenically driven by warming around the planet. As you might expect, the sea ice is uh, responding to that warming, both in the ocean and the atmosphere, less extent, thinner ice, and change in the character of the ice from multi-year ice, ice that survives the season, to nearly the whole Arctic Ocean covered by first-year ice sometime uh, in the next decade and a half. So it'll be no more multi-year ice at some point in time. But these extraordinary changes, you can see that these satellite images show us extraordinary change in the openness in the summertime. These two dates uh, get lots of press to minimum extents of the sea ice in September in the Arctic Ocean. Of course, it's false color imagery here. The, the sea ice is purple and yellow given concentrations in these passive microwave images. But nonetheless, all the black you see is a lot of open. But the, the thing to remember in all of this is, if you step back, that the place is ice covered for nine months of the, out of the year, maybe 10 months, partially or fully ice covered. It's not ice free. We have 2,000, 2,200 nautical miles across the top of the world. And, and the ice is a profound and complex barrier to ships and platforms or whatever. I think that the notion in the media is that the place is becoming ice free and, and uh, there are profound changes. But in fact, from a regulatory standpoint, ship driving standpoint, uh, offshore development standpoint, it's ice covered, partially or fully. Now, longer seasons of navigation, greater openness around, but from a practical use of the Arctic Ocean, 
the place is ice covered. So if it's ice covered, you need the offshore platforms designed to international standards. Same with the ships, if you're gonna drive around ships. So it's so a practical issue, is the place is ice covered. You wouldn't read that in the newspaper. You wouldn't get that from many politicians. But the place is still ice covered. You, you know, if it wasn't ice covered, it'd be very hot around the rest of the planet. Another 10, 15 degrees, maybe even more. Uh, you, you know, in the central Arctic Ocean, it can be minus 50 uh, in the wintertime. And, and so we, we want the ice cover to be there for, for many different reasons. <laughs> uh, because if it really did melt, if it was physically possible to melt, it's probably not physically possible because of the cold temperatures anytime on the planet in the wintertime in the north. But uh, if it was, the rest of the planet would be 20, 30 degrees warmer. Maybe none of us would actually be here. So practical issue. Places ice covered. You hear a lot about the dynamics of the extended continental shelf. If you look at these images on the left is today, the dark line there in the ocean is the EEZ, 200 miles out, leaving an international uh, uh, body of water, uh, high seas it's called, and, and so there you can operate uh, freely outside the bounds of the coastal states. Now you know the process is going on to extend the continental shelf around the whole of the global oceans. But in the Arctic, because it's a kind of a closed Mediterranean Sea, you, you, the, the, the coastal states are encroaching to leave very little at the end of this process. So in the one model is that those two little dark regions will be what would be left after all of the claims would be adjudicated out some out to 300, 300 plus miles under Article 76 of the Law of the Sea. And so this process is ongoing. All the coastal states are exploring. Of course, the United States has not ratified UNCLOSE. All the other states uh, have in, in the Arctic. So we're the only holdout. But we're still exploring, you know. Uh, Icebreaker Healy, we have joint operations with our Canadian colleagues exploring the seabed to extend our continental shelf in the future. Of course, why does everyone want to extend that continental shelf? The specter of oil and gas on, on those continental shelves. But in the end, the model to the right, the bottom line is there isn't going to be much international seabed left. So if China, or I don't want to pick on China, some other country wants to go drill in the Central Arctic Ocean, even if there is any oil there, uh, not much territory left that's outside the coastal state jurisdiction. So this, you know, big rush and some in the media of all these countries coming to drill in the Central Arctic Ocean, they won't be able to drill in easily without leases in the, uh, from the, uh, the coastal states. You know this famous report came out. Uh, there was an early one. USGS issued this report, their analysis. The Arctic Ocean is a gas province, it says, but there's some oil in certain spots. I've put these red dots on one of their maps because I, I work on the environmental protection area. And most of these areas are coastal. And very little, this study says, of oil and gas in the central Arctic Ocean. So you might go out there with a drill, but there's not much out there. It's all coastal. Greenland, the hot spots for oil, Greenland, northern uh, Alaska, of course, offshore Russia and the Kara Sea, those are the hot spots. Lots of places maybe for gas, but you know, I suspect the search and the exploration is on for oil in the Arctic. Uh, just a couple words about this uh, assessment of the Arctic Marine, Marine, Marine Shipping Assessment, the Arctic Council. Lots of players. Three countries led this, the United States, Canada, and Finland, but all the countries uh, provided uh, data and information, uh, large engagement of the indigenous people of the Arctic also. But the bottom line in this study is lots of stakeholders and actors, the Nanaran Arctic, investors, ship classification societies, uh, you name it, Everybody has a vested interest from China to, to, to Norway to whoever in the Arctic. Lots of players and actors uh, to be sorted out in the use of the Arctic Ocean for all of the marine transport. Uh, large study, different components, but one of the important parts was to tease out what are the drivers of Arctic marine transportation. And entering this, we, the study team, knew that most of the diplomats and the people around the table thought that uh, sea ice was driving everything. And the answer was, as you, I've already told you, is that no, it's global economics. It's the connection of the Arctic 
to the global economy in commodities prices, uh, mostly hard minerals and oil and gas that is driving the need for transportation. But we, uh, we had uh, teased out some 130 drivers, things that could, uncertainties that could affect Arctic Marine Transport, and here occur a lot of them, the, the, the status of the legal climate in the Arctic, um, new resource discoveries. You can see a couple things that we, on the right there, shift to nuclear energy. So we were doing this uh, scenarios analysis, about 100 people for two years, uh, in an era when we thought that nuclear energy might be the new way forward. And maybe if we went that direction, the world, uh, that uh, we might not be in search and exploration of oil and gas in the Arctic uh, as much. So it might be influence. Of course, we didn't realize it'd be, we're not clairvoyant, so uh, in the scenarios process, we did not realize the disaster that would happen in Japan uh, in the wake of the uh, earthquake. And uh, we did not realize that countries like Germany would step away from nuclear power. So, but anyway, uh, we also said and oil prices, when we were doing the study, were $147 a barrel. At the end of the study, it was the beginning of the study, it was something like, uh, I'm thinking 57, as I remember. So just the fluctuation of oil prices would have great influence over marine transport systems because they're just a support to oil and gas in, in the Arctic. But we also said if there's a disaster in the Arctic, this one was in the Antarctic during the study, you probably heard about it, the, um, cruise ship, a polar cruise ship, the uh, explorer went down, down at the bottom of the sea today. You can see all the happy customers in the, in the lifeboats. Fortunately, everyone was rescued, the crew and, and, and all of the customers and all of the tourists. But this happened and the ship was in the Arctic uh, six months previous. Um, and and uh, just to, to show you that this, this one kind of regulatory challenge of, of, the, of the Arctic states today and the international maritime community is the regulation of cruise ships globally, but also uh, regionally in, in, in the Arctic. What are these ships, types of ships doing in the Arctic? Making pretty good money. The question is whether they have competency in the pilot house, the right structural standards, the right kind of safety equipment, uh, et cetera. The end result of our scenarios work with the two main drivers of Arctic shipping. Not the only drivers, but the most significant ones are natural resource development in the Arctic and the resulting destinational trade, the carriage of these uh, commodities to global markets, and the governance of, of Arctic shipping. Today, there are no international regulations from the International Maritime Organization to govern international shipping in the Arctic. There are regional, two regional systems in Russia and in Canada, and we in the United States have no uh, different uh, maritime regulations different than the open ocean here around Alaska. So the challenge for Alaska is to institutionalize some, hopefully, international standards. And I say international standards because we want from IMO uh, seamless, kind of integrated, non-discriminatory uh, regulations that apply to all shipping on the, on the planet that might use the Arctic. We have 17 recommendations in the AMSA, the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment. They revolve around these three themes. Uh, enhancing Arctic Marine Shipping is really related to uh, uh, IMO work, International Maritime Organization, institutionalized and mandatory, what's called a polar code of navigation, uh, meaning ship standards, ship structural standards, marine safety gear, and uh, most important, issue is probably competency, training, expertise in the pilot house. Protecting Arctic people and the environment is very clear from emissions, oil spills, etc. And finally, we, we thought that the lack of infrastructure in the Arctic, only two places where there's adequate modern infrastructure, coast of Norway, as you would guess, ice-free, northwest coast of Russia, uh, there's reasonable infrastructure. And infrastructure, a very broad uh, term, ports, oil spill response capacity, communications, uh, salvage, whole long list of stuff that is in the global oceans, but not in the Arctic. Very minimal, if any, uh, true marine infrastructure around the coast of Alaska. So we're starting from ground zero, as an example, uh, with, with not much infrastructure 
earth reports, et cetera. So infrastructure, one example of infrastructure is charting and hydrography. Seven to eight percent of the Arctic Ocean is charted to international navigation standards. Now much more of the Arctic Ocean is charted, but not to, for safe navigation to international uh, navigation standards. To chart the whole of the ocean, uh, the Arctic Ocean would take uh, more than a century. Uh, to chart Alaska will take a good deal of uh, federal money pumped into NOAA to conduct the charting, the, the hydrography that is necessary for charts that will be of an international standard so we can have safe and efficient navigation. Uh, just a bunch of the different uh, activities today. You have probably heard there's an international search and rescue agreement signed by the Arctic states in uh, 2011. And just uh, in May, an international oil spill preparedness and response agreement signed by the Arctic states. The two negotiations for these two agreements was facilitated by the Arctic Council. In other words, uh, a lot of the uh, stakeholders, investors, uh, players like the permanent participants were involved in the negotiation, but the sign-off and final agreement is an Arctic state agreement. So we have those two, and we have a lot of ongoing activities. The most difficult challenge is who are the investors for the infrastructure? So most of us dealing with this issue look to novel and different um, and creative public-private partnerships to handle Arctic infrastructure in the future. I don't think that Washington or the American taxpayer is going to pay for all Arctic infrastructure in the future. Might be true in Russia uh, by the federal government's investment in, in infrastructure in the Russian Arctic, but probably different for Canada and the United States. Uh, Public-private partnerships is maybe the way forward. Finally, last slide, just a, a, a cartoon of, uh, of uh, use today. Uh, commercial use, not, not indigenous use, which is again per pervasive around the whole of the Arctic Ocean, but in industrial and commercial use, the whole of the Arctic Ocean uh, is being traversed in the summertime by all sorts of ships around the margin of the basin, even in the central Arctic Ocean exploring, and, and, and so we have no international rules, we're well beyond the precautionary principle, if you know what that is, uh, and, and, and uh, it's an interesting time where you have the whole of the ocean at the top of the world in the summertime, ships operating uh, with no uh, um, kind of integrated international regulatory regime. Thank you. Why don't we have a couple of questions uh, for uh, Dr. Brigham? Any? Yes, sir. Uh, he, he, Alex will cover that since he's from Conical Phillips. <laughs> I, I, well, what's the, what's the number? 30 kilometers? 20. 20 kilometers. So it's, it's just enough to get, well, he'll cover it, but out of the sh very shallow water into a little bit deeper to handle the, the tankers. And, and I was just wondering, how, like along the, the Beaufort Sea, how, how deep or how thick does the ice get in the middle of the winter along the shoreline? Well, you're talking about thickness of the level ice. Of course, it's rubble fields and it moves and it's dynamic and creates these ridges. But uh, two plus meters is, is a good bet today. Uh, and it, but it's dynamic and so the ice could be uh, 10, 20 meters thick because of the rubble fields. So that's the challenge, I think, for offshore and for shipping is it's the dynamic ice, not necessarily the level ice that you're trying to move through because it's moving. The, the, the new Arctic Ocean, uh, with all this openness of ice and longer seasons of maybe partially ice covered ice may make it more challenging for navigation because the ice is moving under the action of wind before it may have been kind of uh, tight and held but much more dynamic than the past so the the new arctic ocean uh, may be more challenging in certain places to operate of course we have people coming to operate uh, uh, more than any other time in history so any other questions Thank you. Okay, so next up we have uh, Alexander Yerus Yerusalemsky. <laughs>
PA, he has a PhD in naval architecture, has 30 years experience in marine architecture, worked on ship development in Russia, in the US, and Canada, and has helped conduct 23 ICE trials. So go ahead and. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'll be talking about the Arctic crude oil marine transportation today. Continue what uh, Lawson, uh, Professor Lawson Brigham started, uh, giving you a broad, uh, very wide picture, and I will uh, give you a very narrow picture about <clears throat> the marine crude oil transportation. Um, before we got to this very subject, I'd like to bring to your attention a couple of trends that have been uh, observed in the uh, maritime industry for the last 40, 45 years. Because the crude oil transportation by sea is anything but uh, safety, reliability, and uh, economic efficiency. So about safety, <clears throat> the uh, seaborne oil trade is steadily growing, that's for sure. and been growing for a number of decades reaching almost uh, 2.5 billion uh, metric tons of uh, crude oil, which accounts for 37% of uh, all goods shipped by sea. Uh, it might imply increased risk, more oil, more ships, but uh, the trend is uh, quite opposite, and the oil spill in terms of frequency and quantity is declining and declining pretty steep rate. Uh, if we look at 70s, when uh, 24.6 large oil spills from tankers happened, uh, large we uh, account for 700 tons and more, or uh, 50,000 barrels. Uh, last year, 2012, there was zero, none. None of those oil spills happened from the tanker. Uh, it's quite encouraging. And where is uh, the Arctic in this picture, actually? <clears throat> the, AMSA study that uh, uh, Lawson just presented to you shown that uh, in <clears throat> the decade of uh, year 2000, we had roughly 6,000 ships per year uh, sailing the Arctic, uh, but only mm, just a little bit over 200 of them being tankers. So it's just a fraction of the uh, overall uh, uh, tanker operations. And um, more importantly, again, I will probably repeat what uh, Lawson just said, uh, most of the shipping happened in waters that are permanently or seasonally ice-free. <clears throat> uh, seasonally ice-free doesn't mean it's easy because uh, it's easy to operate in seasonally ice-free waters in the summertime when it's really ice-free, but how about winter? Uh, winter is tough. And there were a couple of exceptions of operation year-round, and that's a, a key word, year-round operations. Uh, there was one in Russia and one in uh, northern Quebec in Canada. Uh, it uh, started to change in 2008 when the new Arctic transportation system was developed and launched at uh, the Russian shore near the Warande. And it's located in ice-covered part of the Barents Sea. It's not the uh, free of ice. It's, it's covered with ice about half a year. And in the peak of the season, quite tough. Uh, about the oil spills, interestingly enough, there was no medium or large oil spill ever been recorded in the Arctic ice. So, no oil spill in the ice. So, are we good? Are we safe? Is everything fine? Uh, instead of answering that question, I'll give you the example of the success story. Uh, of the story uh, of the development and uh, operation of this uh, year-round marine transportation system that taking oil from uh, the uh, Russian shore in the Barents Sea to the market. So what is it? Uh, the Marandai located in the southeastern corner of the Barents Sea, uh, often referred as the Pechora Sea. The uh, terminal located 11.4 miles of the shoreline. Uh, it's a very dynamic ice area. And uh, 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 ice-breaking tankers taking uh, the crude oil to the transshipment location near the port of Murmansk which is the ice-free port. It's in the Arctic, very cold, but uh, Gulf Stream makes it uh, ice-free. And from there, conventional open water tankers take it uh, to the market. That's how it works. About a halfway through, uh, the tankers should go, uh, should transit ice. It's about 250 miles out of 550 miles. It's ice-covered uh, region. So the key components of the projects are Arctic shuttle tankers, 
fixed offshore ice resistance offload terminal, offloading terminal called FOIROD. A bow loading system that designed specifically to transfer the crude oil from the terminal to the bow of the vessel. And a storage in the Murmansk FSO where the ships discharge the crude oil. Undoubtedly, the key element of the project is the tanker itself. Without this ship, nothing would happen. Uh, the tanker was designed uh, meeting a number of challenges. And first of all, environmental conditions. They can be quite harsh there, and the level continuous size can grow up to 1.5 meters or five feet. Uh, on top of that, snow ridges that can be quite nasty, nine, 10 meters or 30 feet. Um, ice drift is quite disturbing near the foyerot. It can reach in some points two knots, uh, which is very uh, uh, difficult for offloading operations. The air temperature minus 40 degrees C, it's a design temperature for this tanker with extreme values up to minus 45. Waves are probably not as tough as a North Sea, but still makes E 4.2 meters significant. Uh, the ice transit distance also can be at a uh, good year, uh, 250 nautical miles, and the requirements been uh, to do it reliably and safely, and also no icebreaker support inside on that. That's the new and uh, reliable and safe operations at the loading station as well should be provided. Uh, for that purpose, some ice management and tag assistance near the foyerot is uh, offered. Uh, when you, uh, as a naval architect, I can tell you that there are common design issues for every ship that needs to be designed for the Arctic operation. Is it tanker or icebreaker? Doesn't matter. Or icebreaker tanker. Uh, for <coughs> uh, first of all, ice performance. You have to provide the ship uh, adequate ice performance that she could sail in the area of operation uh, through the uh, uh, selecting right ice breaking concept and the correct propulsion system. In that respect, I will argue a little bit with uh, Lawson because uh, I wouldn't call it Finnish technology. Finnish technology was propulsion system, the, but the rest of that was untie Finnish technology because the Finnish suggestion was rejected uh, of the concept, overall concept of the ship. And there was a joint American-Russian concept uh, that put forward. Uh, the hull form ice resistance that should provide low ice resistance uh, to save some power, reduce the air emission, and, and save some fuel. Winterization, very important. All your deck equipment, anything should work at minus 40 degrees. That's tough. Uh, ice class, uh, the last but not, uh, uh, not the least. Uh, it's very important to select the right ice class and, and uh, make a hull strong enough to withstand the uh, operational ice conditions. Uh, for the Varanday project, uh, on top of that, there were some specific uh, challenges that uh, uh, are depicted in this slide. And first of all, there was no precedent of building such a large ship for the Arctic. This is by far the biggest icebreaker ever built in the world. Uh, if you compare with the biggest um, U.S. Coast Guard icebreaker, Polar class, we call it, or Polar Sea, Polar Star, uh, Lawson Brigham knows them well. Uh, it's about six, seven times as big as that one. It's, it's an impressive size. And uh, therefore, there is no data. There is no uh, full-scale data, which is uh, uh, actually Im extremely important for the designer to use. Uh, no icebreaker support. Well, it's, it makes the ship icebreaker itself. Uh, it should escort uh, uh, herself uh, to have uh, a, a superb maneuverability and backing performance in the ice, uh, be able to deal with ice pressure is when, the, when the ice is compacting and presses the ship and, and can stop with a nuclear icebreaker. And of course, we're dealing with oil projects, so we have production rate, so we have to take, uh, we have to lift the crude on a regular basis. It's a scheduled work, and you, you cannot delay too much, so that's the challenge. Uh, so how does challenges been met? Um, the first of all, you look at the ship, uh, it has extreme ice-breaking bow and extreme ice-breaking stern. So she can go equally well forward, uh, ahead, and astern. Basically no difference, you can see the numbers in the little table. You can break at three knots continuously without stopping. 
uh, this uh, this thickest ice that uh, can be uh, encountered on the, on the transit route. But of course, uh, uh, passing, uh, transiting the ridges is much more slow business. Um, propulsion system, that's an interesting development because uh, this tanker for the first time for uh, the size of the ship and, and uh, operational purpose, been fitted with two large outboards that uh, have a 360 rotation capability and a class that uh, we selected to require 23 megawatts and uh, but that was based on old technology using the conventional uh, shafts and, and propellers uh, that technology is shown that we can use 17 megawatt and get the same so we negotiated with the class and the class agreed to approve 20 megawatt power with a very high ice torque and we still have the same class uh, saving a little bit of fuel and some emission in the air. Um, rules actually is an interesting thing. Uh, the technology is always a little bit ahead, a step ahead of the rules of the classification society and it's normal because people invent something and then classification society is trying to deal with that. And um, uh, we analyzed the mode of operation for this ship and decided that she doesn't need backing and ramming. Back, backing and ramming is the maneuver when, when the ship is stopped by the ice, cannot move anymore, then it should back and run the reach. Uh, for this ship we don't need it because we can turn around and go astern, chewing by the propellers the ice formation and go smoothly through the ridges. Therefore, uh, that mode of operation is out. Then we don't need Arctic 7 class, and uh, we stuck with uh, Arctic 6 without compromising the safety and actually increasing the safety because well, that's much safer maneuver than backing and running. Uh, this hull strengthening as well, uh, we were ahead of uh, any classification society who didn't give us uh, any advice or any guidance how to design the stern for this ship. Uh, on on um, um, yeah, upper part is what the uh, the class requires. So the stern is very weak. The whole steel is put here in in the bow quarter, but this ship, with as it was, can turn on the dime and and can go astern. So it it experienced high ice loads on the stern.